Hey, how you doing? So on a couple of comments, uh, actually a couple of thoughts. Um, let's, let's start with the first one. I finally realized why people like beaches so much. Um, you know, right now we have the coronavirus. People have been inside all day uh, for at least two weeks, uh, which I, I believe is the sort of incubation period for the virus. Although it seems to be make, it seems to have mutated and is now making a comeback. Um, so ultimately, if you haven't been, if you if you're in a cold place like Canada or the northern states, and you know you're, you're dealing with three, four, five, six months of winter, uh, and you only have about one or two weeks or even a month every year to go on vacation, spending one week of that time on a beach somewhere, you know, is, is probably one of your best bets. It probably makes you feel better. Uh, but that really doesn't apply for people like me who are from California who get plenty of sunshine. Um, and that explains why if you wanted to ask me where to travel, I would probably pick something that I'm, I'm just not used to, like snow uh, or, or you know, rather than a beach to go to the mountains. So first of all, a lot of our preferences are conditioned based on what we have access to um, and also what we consider to be different. Uh, I'm sure if you're in, you know, Montreal, and, you know, going out to Mexico or, or you know, somewhere in the Caribbean uh, for one week out of the year probably makes you feel really happy, even though, to me, all beaches, you know, sort of look the same. Uh, but to somebody from Montreal getting that vitamin D, um, getting a tan, all, all those things probably make, um, you know, you feel better if you're from a, a very cold place. So you have to really understand, first of all, when, you, when you're choosing travel places, uh, what you're looking for and whether you're being misled by advertising and what else is out there uh, that you might not have considered. And that could be bookstores, libraries, uh, festivals. Um, you know, a lot of things are going on all over the world, um, academic conferences and so on. So try to maybe broaden your horizons and just ignore all the advertising because a lot of that advertising is tied into, or at least comes from real estate developers. You know, you, you, know, you build a mall or a hotel, a lot of those malls, you know, get approved. It's easier to get approved to build something on, on the beachfront. And so as a result, you've got, you know, because quite frankly, you can do mixed use, right? You can have a portion of the ho of, of the building be a hotel. The bottom, bottom of it could be a mall. Uh, it, locals will go to the beach. And so you have this sort of domestic economy, domestic demand that will keep this sort of thing going, which is why the banks are, are more likely to loan you money to build some beachfront property um, as opposed to something else, you know, in the middle of a city, for example, where you might be building a shopping mall uh, down the street from another shopping mall and, and so on, or opening a store or a business that's, com that's already in a highly competitive district, uh, whereas there's only so much beachfront property. So that's the first thing that, that occurred to me. Um, and number two, I, there's actually this really good show on uh, Amazon Prime. It's called Undone, if I don't, if I remember correctly. It's, it's um, basically... It's an, it's not anime, but it's a, it's a cartoon that looks like an oil painting uh, that's come to life. And the storyline is fantastic. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's called Undone 2020, um, the year 2020. And uh, it's got just an amazing dialogue, which is what I look for, uh, in, addition, in addition to being just unique. And I wanted to mention that because you don't see too many unique things these days. But the main character actually has a hearing aid. You can look for it. You can actually look for it if you, now, now that I've mentioned it, um, and the other thing you want to look for, though, is, you know, you've got this great attempt to be inclusive. Uh, the problem, of course, is that it's giving you a, a bit of a misleading information because if somebody actually does have a hearing aid, and these days they're a lot smaller. And so it's not as, you know, in, in the cartoon, you can see it easily. She's got one of the old ones uh, or the big, big ones and the old ones. Um, and so, you know, but the problem is that if somebody really is hearing impaired, they're, they're going to look at your lips. They're not going to have, make eye contact with you all the time. Um, so this is the problem with that is that it took me a while to figure out if, if it was a Bluetooth device or a hearing aid because, um, you know, like I said, she's just she's making eye contact. She's, she's never looking at anybody else's lips, which is very unusual if, in fact, you're hearing impaired. So you got inclusion, but in a way that's misleading. Um, but in any case, you should, should still check it out, um, you know, just because it, it's just a beautiful... Um, I mean, I've only seen one episode, the first episode, but it just looks amazing. Which, so let's move on to the third thing that, that, that's been on my mind. Um, you know, we, we talked about, you know, like I said, data being misleading, advertising being misleading. So what I was thinking about um, today is just sort of some philosophical questions. You know, one, one of those questions is, 
now that we have the capacity to, to reduce mistakes, human error, to almost zero, if not zero, uh, how is that going to change our lives? So let's start with an example. Right now, um, apparently the, the error rate for pharmacies uh, for the, that dispense, you know, pills, uh, you know, that's, that still, for the most part, includes, you know, human beings involved. You have a machine that dispenses it, but for, you know, um, you know, if you tap the button or, or something a little bit too quickly, you can see how, you know, you might either increase the dosage uh, too much or just the, the number of pills too much and so on. It's the same thing, you, you know, if you work in retail, you know, sometimes you'll get something on your, on your scanner that says, pick up this item in this cubby. Well, sometimes it, it won't tell you is that there's not enough detail because it's a handheld device. It's almost as big as your phone. And so it's not going to be able to tell you if it's one item or three of them. And that's, that's a problem when you've got, you know, them stuck together because, you know, you've got packaging. The packaging companies don't necessarily talk to um, the retail brick and mortar companies. And so if I go to the cubby and I'm trying to, you know, and, and my, my scanner tells me to pick up one of these, I, I don't know if, if it's a pack, a set, uh, sometimes, not always. Uh, people are getting smarter about these things. Um, but, you know, and quite frankly, if, you, if you're on a time limit, you know, you might as well just err on the side of, you know, over, you know, sort of, um, o you know, giving the customer more. Uh, of course, that's, you know, terrible because now your inventory numbers are all screwed up. In any case, uh, I'm sure that'll be fixed at some point. It's a software issue. Um, you know, as well as, a, as just a tangible issue. So the, the, the point, though, is that before I got, got off track, is that you can now see that, you know, right now, if you have a 1% to 5% error uh, mistake rate uh, in terms of dispensing medicine, which is something that's, you know, that, that's life-saving uh, if done properly and life-threatening if done improperly, if you have all of these dis dispensaries uh, measuring the dosage and the number of pills, um, this is a very simple example, um, by machine, you can probably get those numbers, you know, the mistake rate down to, down to zero, or at least 0.1. I don't know if there might be some rust on the machine or the software might have a glitch, but quite. But you're really looking at a scenario where you go from a 5% error rate to something like zero, which of course reduces the number of jobs, but may, maybe not um, in, that specific, in, in that case. So the world that we're moving towards um, is a world where technology is, is enticing because it, it allows us to, to not, only, not only be more efficient, but also uh, to reduce the number of mistakes. And with respect to the inventory problem I just mentioned, you know, you've got uh, actually the biggest loss when retail operations is not from shoplifters, it's from embezzlement, from employees themselves. Um, and so, you know, you've got that, that situation as well where machines don't steal. The other side of the coin is that, you know, you may have a 0% mistake rate. What about hacking? You've got a scenario where, where you can have an outside hacker coming in, disrupting the, soft, disrupting the software, or you just have a disgruntled employee going in and, and manipulating the configurations without even getting into things like source code or middleware or whatever, um, without getting too technical, right? You can simply just adjust whatever's on the layer um, and manipulate whatever, you know, you can tell machines are, that they're instructed by you know, human beings on what to do. So you can actually manipulate uh, whether the control panel or, or whatnot uh, in order to change it. And it's true you might have a security software on top of that that might prevent you from doing that in some cases, like obviously with a nuclear plant of some sort, but on something that actually does modulate quite frequently, um, you, you can see that you know it's not quite as easy as just putting in an AI program and just you know, sitting back and, and, and letting it work. Um, you're always gonna have human mistakes involved uh, simply because human nature is, you know, can be volatile. So you've got a scenario where you can see that, you know, this sort of push towards AI also necessitates higher security. In other words, if you have a scenario where the machines can dispense, you know, one human, human being can only, you know, screw up so much um, within a, a factory situation, right? Um, there's always a, 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 a switch that turns everything off on, on the conveyor belt and so on. A machine, on the other hand, if you feed it the wrong software, it can destroy uh, quite a few things. And so the, the idea here is that because of that, you know, higher risk, uh, where simply manipulating a few lines of software code or maybe more than just a few lines results in catastrophe, uh, you know, suddenly the chlorine in the system, you know, go, goes from, you know, whatever the acceptable limits are into, into something that's not acceptable. Uh, it, it's everything. You can look at water treatment. You can look at all these things and, and you know, quickly see that the, the risks go up massively. 
um, when you when you depend excessively on machines uh, that actually that that are that that include software, um, even if you have a security system on top of that, um, and you know so you can go back and forth, but what what's what you can see as well is that because the risks go up, the risks of catastrophe goes up much more um, because machines can cause more damage if corrupted than human beings. Um, you can see that the need for security um, suddenly is justified. Today, you can say that, well, you know, the security spending is outrageous. Um, it doesn't really create a situation where we're safer. And besides, anybody can protect, protect you with an, un, un, an unlimited budget. And so what you really want to do is you want to sort of at least try to choose between, choose between guns and butter. Uh, but, but the whole thing with AI is that once you have that level of risk um, on all these systems that are now interlinked, the IoT being the famous example, you know, you've got a situation where you actually have to, have to spend more on security. Because now you want to be able to surveil all the employees in real time to make sure that they don't go into that computer and change the configuration uh, into something that shouldn't be there. Um, you want to make sure that the people that are entering the facility that can, you know, corrupt the software, you want to make sure everyone is where they need to be, uh, that you don't have somebody coming in, um, you know, that's not supposed to be there. So suddenly security cameras everywhere, CCTVs, all those things suddenly from a philosophical standpoint make, um, make sense. You know, it's no longer an issue of privacy because the risks of security have gone up so much and now that we've transferred a lot of responsibility into machines. Uh, with a much higher processing power and therefore a much higher chance of uh, much higher risk of danger. Uh, you know, you can see how suddenly the calculus supports even more security spending than what we have now, which of course will lead to a security state. So in the past, you really did have these arguments between against, you know, privacy and security and weighing them. But the more you move into, you know, delegating a lot of your tasks, especially crucial ones, um, you know, what ends up happening is the security spending is now something that is very difficult to argue against. Um, and so the question is, that's one of the things you want to think about. Uh, it's not just an issue of reducing the mistake rate. It's an issue of, you know, considering all the other changes in society that go along with that, uh, including just, just a, a much less, a much less viable argument for privacy. Uh, and a much better argument for the current state of security, the current trajectory of security spending um, and surveillance. And so one of the things that you that I was thinking about that we want to also discuss, we're not discussing enough, is that when you have these sorts of scenarios, you know, we currently don't have a treaty in terms of, well, let me back up. Uh, so once you have all these systems, you know, you, you run into a problem in terms of you know, security, right? And so the problem with security really is that, you know, you really do want your data to be with Amazon and not your mom and pop shop uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, you know, Amazon's got the money, they've got the security, they've got the experience. Whoever is in, whoever happens to be established in that security software business today, uh, whether it's cloud or not, um, or AWS or not, whoever happens to be established today, uh, they're the ones that will, will probably be there 30 years from now. Or maybe even longer than that, because the, ent the barrier to entry within those businesses is now far beyond anything that an ordinary business can do, at least not without government help. So it's not just a matter of software or source code or hacking. We are now entering a society where, you know, the barriers to entry because of the higher security risks, risks now give way to a monopoly um, or at least a duopoly. And you can see that just by looking at, you know, let, let's take Cisco, for example. Uh, you've got a situation where, you know, a long time ago, say 20, 20 years ago, you had a, a, quite a few companies that you could have gone to that would have given you equivalent services. I don't remember the names right now, but I do remember there were about four or five companies. And I, remember, and I mentioned one of them to the CEO, uh, Chambers, and he sort of chuckled because none of those companies are quite small. They, were, they had a market cap of like maybe two, three, four billion dollars um, uh, compared, you know, compared to the, say, 100 plus billion dollars market cap that Cisco has, justifiably so in comparison to the smaller ones, um, given the level of the data and, the, and what they handle and the traffic they handle. So what you're looking at now, you know, the reason that, that these companies were, 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 I mean, he knew they were not a threat. Those companies don't exist anymore. They've been bought out or they've just simply gone bankrupt. Now, even, even a company that you might know about, like Juniper Networks, 
their, if you look at their stock price, it's gone almost nowhere. So you might have, you know, you've got, of course, Barracuda Networks. You have all these things that they may even have been bought out. Um, but you have, a, you have a reduced number of companies and people keep talking about monopolies. But in, in, in you know, quite frankly, in, in a situation where, you know, you suddenly have a, an interlinked system, you know, suddenly you, you actually, once again, the argument goes in favor of having whoever is the best be in charge of more data. So in other words, you want Google to manage the data because they're the best. Even, you know, even though you've got Wolfram, you've got a couple of, you know, you've got Bing and so on. Um, you know, you've got all these other ones, but because it's so essential, you actually do want the best company to handle the most work, which again, creates what people might call a natural monopoly. But in this case, there's nothing natural about it, right? It's just simply the way we're going uh, that then necessitates, you know, a security apparatus uh, that then creates the need for a uniform standard, which then is justified, which then, then helps justify keeping out foreign comp competition like Huawei, which might reduce the monopoly power, uh, whether it's pricing or something else. And this is the problem with law. Right now, monopoly is really based on, you know, the concept, the concept of monopoly is I get a monopoly by underpricing the competition uh, unfairly or by selling my goods be below cost. I have access to you know a credit line that you don't have access to, and then once I once I wipe you out or buy you out, I then raise prices. Well, again, the problem here is that if, <laughs> that that analysis, legal analysis, no longer applies. You know, services are free. Google is free, not really because you're selling your data, right? You're selling you know that that, that data is what you're giving them. That's worth a lot of money, uh, just not on a, on an indiv on an individual basis. With a lot of money to advertisers, right? You can imagine if you you know on, on an aggregate and sort of on a combined basis. Um, but once the sort of real problem with, monop with monop monopoly now is you've got dispersed users uh, that are in, in individually useless, uh, or well, not useless actually, that, that are simply um, that, are, that are not as useful um, as individuals, but are extremely useful in groups, especially with, within local you know, uh, places and, and, and so on. Um, you can see how that could be used in voting, for example, right? If you want to really go local and district by district and so on. And Justice Kagan figured that out, by the way. She had a dissent her best yet uh, on precisely this issue, where in the future, you know, where you have gerrymandering issues, you can actually, uh, if you don't pay attention to the bigger picture, uh, technology can simply overwhelm democracies. Uh, simply, you know, if, because you can actually gerrymander districts using software that, you know, assuming you have access to the voting patterns, you can just gerrymander districts that provide two-party two parties permanent, a duopoly, right? Permanent status, uh, forever actually, um, depending on, on immigration numbers. So um, you see how you've got, we're, we're sort of you know, slouching towards a, at least a, mono, a duopoly situation, if not a monopoly situation, which then creates problems in terms of you know, world trade and globalization. Because the problem with data, of course, is that you know, in order for it to be safe, you want it to be in your home, in your home country. So, and, and so if I do this, if I do the source code, the minute I get that data out of my country and onto a, onto a different server, you not only have human, human problems, right? Um, you also have just general problems. Um, you know, that the farther that data goes away from your own security apparatus and your own vendors. Um, and so you can see why people are now, um, countries are now embracing nationalism. A lot of that has to do with data, safety, security, and so, you know, you, you're, we're sort of slouching towards a future where people, advanced countries export hardware, but then control the software uh, on their home base. Um, the power, reserving the power to make that hardware uh, useless um, with a few clicks of a button. So when, when you think about all these things, let's, let's sort of think about that future um, and what we're giving up in exchange to for a a more convenient, not just a more convenient lifestyle, but clearly a safer lifestyle where that pharmacist, um, you know, not, not only for pharmacists, but the embezzlement rate um, goes from whatever it is down to zero. That's the future that we are told will be a, um, the one that we should want. Um, so let's take it, let's take it to, to, let's go to, into a second example. There's always, you know, with data, of course, you want to use it, right? Um, it's very difficult to have data and not use it. Um, there are all these psychological tests. One, one of the most famous ones is you put something that a child wants in front of a child. Chocolate is, is his most popular example. Um, anything with sugar, um, basically cocaine for a baby. And you know, you, know so you put that in front of a child, a big bowl of it. So you put in like 
uh, basically your Halloween grab bag, your bowl, and your whole Halloween, um, you know, goodies uh, that you've collected on, from the neighborhood block um, that night, uh, and you put it in front of a child, and you say, you can only have, uh, there's, there's a thousand pieces of different chocolate here and candy here in front of you. You can only have four pieces. Uh, usually the, the testing is between, the child has to be between five and seven or five and eight, or maybe four and eight. Um, so what you do is you say, you're trying to teach patience and, and delayed gratification, which, you know, every psychologist will tell you it's response, it, it predicts, it's a good predictor, um, a highly um, accurate predictor of future success. And so the test, of course, is, you know, you, tell the, you put it in front of the kid and tell, tell the kid to wait two minutes or four minutes. Uh, and then you leave the room and then you see what happens, right? Um, now, here's the problem. Um, you know, someone like me, right? I, I, you know, well, let's back up. That's, that's the simple test, right? You can see how employers will at some point do the same thing, right? Um, you know, they'll give a test to all their employees and then at some point what will happen is, you know, they'll have a data step that will say these employees are, you know, the ones that stay with us the longest, the ones that are more honest, the ones that are more productive and so on. Those employees that answered those questions incorrectly or did that puzzle uh, a certain way, uh, those are the ones we don't want. Well, here's the problem. Let's to go back to the prior, previous example. I would have failed that test with the, with the chocolate. I'm sure I would. Um, I, I fail it today. Um, I just had, I just had a, 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 a ice cream for lunch. Um, well, for a late lunch. So, um, you know, I think, I think the day, night before I had M&Ms for, for dinner. Um, didn't finish the whole bag, but in any case, uh, so you've got a situation where, you know, every, every survey, every statistic will say that someone, uh, who eats the whole bag of candy that you put in front of them, uh, is, you know, is, is less likely to be successful, uh, simply because, you know, you want to promote people who have delayed gratification. Um, here's the problem with that, right? If, if the fact that, I, I eat the whole bag of candy because I know I can handle it. Uh, if I'm a kid, I may even eat it knowing I'm going to pay for it later on, but I know that. So I'm, I'm making a choice. Um, I may eat the whole bag of candy and then realize, well, now I've got to go up and down the stairs 15 times instead of five times. These tests cannot account for these changes. That's the problem with standardization. That's the problem with having a society that is lurching towards a single standard. Because a single standard allows you, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, anything that's more uniform is easily controlled, uh, which is good for security. Uh, it, it's, it's also more cost effective. Um, so if you only let Cisco take over your things, uh, as opposed to letting Huawei from China come in, uh, things are just, just easier, right? You just have to have one backdoor um, as opposed to 15. Um, in any case, so you can see how it, you know, you, you've got this data, but it doesn't allow for permutations. Some people think that you will one day allow for permutations, but I don't, you know, there are so many problems with permutations. It's just like a virus mutating. You can't predict how the virus will mutate. You may have simulations, but there's, there are so many different possibilities that, the, you know, the mutations are, you know, are random. <clears throat> so we don't actually know uh, what will, what will, what that, outcome will be because mutations are oftentimes, you know, and furthermore, you don't know if that initial mutation is negative, but then leads to a positive mutation uh, later on. So it's a, sort of the same thing as saying, well, I've got one, I let in one immigrant, that guy's poor, uh, has a high school education, that, that immigrant has a child, um, call that, uh, I guess we call that first generation. Uh, first generation happens to be in a small town, uh, goes to high school, gets that, gets that diploma, but, you know, isn't really all that interesting. That person, you know, then has, has a child. That kid gets tired of being in a small town, goes, goes out to the big city and becomes, you know, uh, starts earning a lot more money. <clears throat> so if you look at the data, you can't predict on, you know, based on that one person, the first one, what's going to happen in the future. Uh, furthermore, by the time you get down to the, that, that second, was it second generation, the second generation, uh, you know, you've got a situation where that person might be making more money, so you, so that person looks like a net gain economically for the country, but you don't know if, again, there's so many other factors. Was the immigrant on, on well, probably not, well, was the first generation on welfare? Did they get some sort of social benefits? Um, how, there are so many things that you cannot factor in. Even if you have CPUs and processors that are, that are capable of causing, you know, massive damage 
um, and also many, uh, and also just m massive numbers of good things and convenience. Uh, you still can't figure out, you know, you still can't account for the direction, whether positive or negative, of, of you know, various um, randomness, because you can't predict that second iteration of what's going to happen, because it's too random, right? It's too, um, what we call attenuated. So, so I've given, given you that second example, and so you can see how, you know, but if the problem with the counter argument there is that, well, wait a second, you know, now that we're going into a world where you have security everywhere, a uh, fewer number of jobs because of higher technology and machines doing more work, um, you know, you've, you've got a situation where we actually do want to have um, a, a scenario where we can judge people um, accurately, and psychological tests might not be the, might, might not be the way to go. Um, but what, you know, we do want to create scenarios where we can, uh, you know, measure things like integrity or give people opportunities uh, to show traits that are not that are immeasurable, um, at least not at least by data. So, I had a point. I'm going there. Um, so you've got the second the second scenario is. You know, once you have that data, you tend to use the data. You then exclude all these employees that might otherwise ch have changed your company or at least been good for your company. Now, you've got a fewer number of jobs, you know, so you've actually excluded people and then you've resulted, you've, you've, you're growing at a quite a fast rate, but you're growing in a way because you're growing based on the data. Uh, you're growing in a way that guarantees conformity because you're, you're choosing from the same set of people. Now, this happens without machines, right? You can go into any sort of financial, a major financial company, you know, a lot of them will look the same racially, they, you know, just uh, fashion wise, even on height, uh, maybe they all, they're all part of the same basketball team back in college, uh, club team. So this happens today, but no, nobody thinks it's a good thing that it happens today, that, that you know, just based on, a, on the college your parents paid for, um, you know, for you to get into at the age of, you know, 18, that then leads to this club network and then leads to this other job um, where, you, where you all play golf every Sunday. I don't know, I don't golf, so I don't know when you, when's a good day to play. Um, and, and then you join the country club and so on. Nobody thinks that's a good thing. We, we, we've actually been trying to move away from that. What I'm trying to say is that the machines and the data and the security risks are now moving us inexorably towards that direction. Um, and of course the response will be that you know, it may actually be something where it's not going to be a, a, an employment pool that looks all the same because now with the data, you can actually pull from all over the country, all, all over the world. So you have all these people that think the same, but look different, which is going to be even more confusing, um, you know, harder to resolve. So um, my, my point to all this is that the real problem that we ought to be solving for is, you know, is the, is the difficulty in measuring the immeasurable. And integrity being the main one, um, and so you know, none of that data is not going to. You know, you can you can measure for security, um, and so people will argue that well, you don't need to. You know, from a strictly you know straightforward basis, you don't need to solve uh, for the for the integrity problem. Integrity problem if you solve the security problem. In other words, if you have constant surveillance, nothing gets stolen. Um, you have an inventory that um, is perfect. Um, you know, in other words, it's all electronic. If you once the retail worker removes the item from the cubby, there's an electronic um, bar that, that then you scan, that then automatically updates the system. By the way, we have that now. It doesn't work, right? Because people move things around. The cubby hole gets full. Uh, sometimes you have too many. You might have a shorter employee. They don't want to go all the way. To, they have to go all, all the way to the top of the ladder, uh, which is unsafe. You can't ever go down the very top step. Um, you know, I've done that once, don't advise it. Uh, so you have all these situations um, where, you know, you, you still have human beings involved. Um, that, that's a manual ladder. There's a, there are some ladders where, you know, you just, it's sort of like a booster seat. You push a button and then you go straight up uh, and then you can pick it up. But that's, you, the aisles, you know, this technology is something that's layered on top of old, you know, physical infrastructure. Uh, so some of these things can actually fit. Um, again, if you actually work in, in any sort of job, uh, you notice that random. You will notice randomness everywhere. So, and it's not something you get fooled by. Um, so, the question really becomes: Where do we go from here? Now, if, if you think about just the consolidation that we're, that we're moving towards, because of the high cost of security. Sorry, not the high cost of security. Security costs are going down because of the high risk of going with an, uh, a new vendor for security, 
or one that isn't as big as Amazon or one that does, that does not have Google's resources, um, if, we, if we account for that, um, the question becomes, you know, what happens to a lot of other jobs? What happens to uh, the economy? And what you see now is that you have a risk of war because at this point, you know, if data becomes more valuable, it's also li liable to get stolen. Um, and, you know, the problem is the only people that are going to be able to steal it will be um, billionaires, criminal organizations, and state actors, governments. <clears throat> and so the next war, if this keeps up, will probably happen either because of, because of a false flag, um, you know, where someone pretends to be somebody from a different country in order to start a war. Um, and, you know, just be, but quite frankly, you've got a situation where we don't have a treaty now. This is a, a gross mistake by the, you know, gross negligence by the United Nations where we don't have anything, we know cyber attacks happen all the time. We don't know what kind of cyber attacks are, are under international law um, acceptable to justify a physical invasion. So there's a couple of scenarios we can talk about here. Um, I'm Russia, I hack into the Democratic National Party servers. I don't do anything with that data. I just look at the data and I get out. Um, I don't manipulate it. I don't change the, the, uh, the outcome um, the results of the voting tallies within the electronic voting machines. Don't do any of that stuff. I just get in and get out. Well, that's, you know, that's a cyber attack. Is it going to justify an invasion of Moscow? No. Um, what if I am, what if my, a criminal organization within um, some other country, uh, you know, decides to uh, hack into the hospital and then in trying to, to block data, in other words, in, in holding data ransom, uh, in order to get paid, in order to release it, what if they accidentally shut out, shut down all the ventilators and kill 15, 20 people? Uh, what if they threatened to, to actually do that to a criminal organi organization? Um, you know, does, does whatever country this is happening to get to go and invade the other country and uh, um, violate the other country's sovereignty in order to take out that criminal organization, in order to protect its citizens? Uh, there's no treaty. We don't know any of this stuff yet. Um, well, let's say you have a cyber attack, it's just steal stuff. This is the most common cyber attack. You just start stealing things. Um, it, you know, it's not just, you know, sort of uh, Bitcoin or any of that stuff. It's just, just you know, data, like I said, is valuable. Um, you know, so a lot of that, I think, accounts, you know, for a significant percentage of GDP. I don't know if it's 1% or 2%, but the question is, you know, what if it goes beyond that, you know, whatever it is currently? So let's say somebody just levels up on these attacks, uh, shuts down, affects another country's GDP by shutting down all the financial networks. Um, uh, all the casinos, their software gets you know, messed up for one week. They lose X amount of revenue. That, is, that GDP maybe for the whole nation is, let's take Las Vegas, right? Make it easy. And, and Atlantic City, uh, you know, locally, the disruption to revenue is massive, uh, but nationally, not really. Was that justify, you know, and so on, on, on the basis of national GDP, it's not 1%. On the basis of local and state GDP, it probably is 5% or something, depending on the length of time uh, that operations are disrupted. Uh, so does that justify an invasion of physical assets? Um, does that justify a, a proportional? What would be a proportional response? Um, we don't know. There's no, there's no treaty. We have a treaty. We have treaties for everything, by the way. This is, you know, as a lawyer, you know this, right? There's a treaty for, um, you know, even the differentiating um, how far out in the sea you can operate um, based on a, an, you know, whether or not something is called an island or a rock. There's, there's actually treaties to say, right, you can fish up to this point if it's a rock. If it's a little bit bigger and it's considered an island, you only get this much you know, leeway. Um, everything's been thought, I think it's called a law of the seas. So, um, which is, you know, but here's the problem with the UN, by the way. Uh, parties have to consent, both parties have to consent in order to invite and basically invite UN jurisdiction to resolve the issue. So uh, if you have a dispute and you're the bigger the country with the bigger guns, bigger army, and you know you're doing something wrong, but not, you know, you're just, you're not actually disrupting the other person's economy, you're just sort of in their way. There's no, you just don't consent to UN jurisdiction and they just keep doing it. Uh, you can see the same thing happening with settlements in some countries, right? You just keeps taking somebody's land. Um, what, it, when, what happens at that point? I mean, you know, the other guy doesn't have an army. You can condemn them for as much as you want. Uh, you can try to persuade them by saying that, you know, a, a two-state solution is going to work. Uh, you'll be safer in the end. But, um, you know, you can see how diplomacy has, in, in many cases, simply failed, um, despite best efforts. 
and we're going into a, a scenario where it's going to get worse. And the question then becomes, you know, what do you do at that point? Once we're there uh, at a point of no return where you do have a monopoly, you do have a duopoly, um, you do have a, a system of, of international law that doesn't really help the weaker party to the extent that, um, I mean, to the extent that you have a situation where, um, you know, one side isn't committing necessarily human human rights violations; they're, they're just it's just theft. Um, you know that that's something where um, you know it, it's it's you know the UN again is very good for post war, right? After a war, you got to figure out the boundaries. You got to move people. People are displaced. You want to put them in camps. You want the, the UN knows how to do all that stuff. Um, it has a long history of doing these things. We had two world wars. Um, what what is really unusual here, especially with cyber attacks. Is that not only there's no that there's no treaty, but you know you could start a war. A war could happen if you know if some coder somewhere um, decides to create a software code um, that is that, that is so malicious that it becomes like a, similar to a pandemic and it shuts down all these systems, uh, that including hospital systems. There's you no know, that that would be more like, likely to be a criminal organization, but that would be under the jurisdiction of another country. Right, so that again is something that few people are not necessarily talking about um, in terms of a resolution process because it's supposedly out of jurisdiction. Um, and you know, we, we need to create a scenario where if it's a state actor uh, that's doing these things in order to create competitive uh, a competitive advantage or to do what's called asymmetrical warfare. Right, somebody puts sanctions on you, you decide, well, you want to make life difficult for me, I'll make, I'll make it difficult for you too. Let's just sh start shutting down your financial systems uh, of four or five companies. That then leads to an assassination of a military leader in, your, in, some, in a third country. Um, and then that then re results in, in another proportionate response uh, that affects GDP. This whole thing is capable of getting out of control. And one of the things that's shocking to me is that we don't have the legal systems in place uh, to, to fix all these things. Uh, oh, sorry, that, that are even in a position where we're trying to come up with ways of making life easier for people, um, but we're not able to come up with ways that, make, that actually make people safer, um, at least not on a global effort, which is why we're becoming more nationalistic. This is simply the simpler way of doing things. It's not the safer way of doing things. It's a simpler way of doing things. And it seems like we're going, to, we're going to retreat into that scenario, into our shells, until we can figure out these bigger questions better. And then maybe we'll come out of our shells and then move back into, into a more robust globalization. But these are the things you want to think about um, if you want to think about the big, big issues.